Live, live, good morning to everybody and we're live. Thank you for joining us today on our usual morning mar markets roundup uh, today as we get through market data, market information and market analytics uh, today on Wealth Wednesday on Behind the Markets. Um, usually we just had a little bit, well, not unusual, it's unusual. We have said a little bit of a technical glitch, but we are back on air and we are ready to go. And a good morning to you, Stephanie, and how are you doing? Morning, Manyumba. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And it's Wealth Wednesday. We've got a few things to go through today. So in the presence of time, let's get pressing into it. Today on Wealth Wednesday, we start off with our market roundup for the day. First thing that we've seen on the markets today is that we've seen that the quacha has gone down a little bit. Uh, the dollar has gone down a little bit to 19.3579. It appears 19.4 seems to be, 19.45 seems to be the upper, the upper limit of the dollar and it does seem to be stalling right around that point so we did see that about 1.7 percent yesterday is where we're down on the week uh, sorry where the dollar is up on the week uh on in the last seven days 7.23 percent and year to date 6.97 percent it's still in a buying pattern uh though it, it did take a little bit of a momentary slump but this looks like some tax payments that are probably due uh, at the moment or tax payments that are coming in at the moment so all share index yesterday moved up 0.4 percent as we saw so ZCCM jumped for the first time in a while, up 10% uh, to 42 quarter per share. Obviously, news is expecting that now we're going to start seeing cash flows increasing from ZCCCM ever since their new deal with Kansanchi. So that's an expectation that we're looking at as well. While simultaneously, we're looking, we're also looking at a uh, an increase of 0.9%. And we also saw uh, CEC up 0. Uh, also up 0.2% yesterday as well. Uh, we're also seeing that the stock market is up 1.72% and up to all-time high still of 8,369, up 14.06% year-to-date. While bond index was up 0.21%, in dollars up 0.51%, and interest rates scaled down low, but, but remember they're still very high on the year. Uh, simultaneously, we did see that the RAND was down 2.54% yesterday. That's good for cross-border trading activity, but the volatility is still problematic. Down 2.33% on the week, but up 8.23% on the month. Those are the high levels of volatility and wild swings in the market for anybody who's trying to understand how to deal with SA currencies. But remember, that has got to do with a lot of cross-border activity. That also affects a lot of cross-border activity. But it does seem like a lot of the the empathy, the the um, acceleration in the RAND is starting to slow down. That's some of the underlying indicators we're seeing. Less up days and slow and, and less acceleration. In fact, we're seeing deceleration in RAND price movements uh, next versus the dollar. Now, we also are seeing that uh, year to date, the bond index is up 16.18%, down uh, up 1.91% on the month, just enough to keep in touch with inflation and keep above inflation. So we are seeing that bonds are still beating inflation generally throughout this year. While the USD GRZ index is up 8.6% is up year to date, still down 3.93% on the month. And interest rates, as you can see, there was that huge little spike that moved from about 2.24.1%. Sorry, Stephanie, I think we're getting a little bit of feedback here. 20... Sorry, I think we're going to try and deal with a little bit of a technical sound issue for the meantime. Um, so, yes, dealing with, uh, as we're seeing that, uh, we, we are seeing that our, 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 our composite yield is at 25.4%. Now, we did see also yesterday copper was down 1.69%. Uh, that's also got to do with uh, moves coming in from China, while oil also shaved off its 86.2 down to 86.28, $86 on the dot, while gold was also at exactly a stuck rate yesterday. Simultaneously, we did see that cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, was up 2% yesterday um, on the strength of Bitcoin, which came back up, and Ethereum up 1.1%, with gold in Quacha down 2.9%. So where are we looking at on the broad asset mix? Broad asset mix, we're still seeing that bonds are still the leading of the conventional assets, up 16.2% on the year, with stocks up 14.1% on the year. USD up 7%, and gold up 7, 12.7%. So we're still in a relatively defensive position. Bitcoin up 90, 90.18% on the year. Remember, that's got to do with the Q1 performance. The last two, the last quarter was really tough. Uh, and if you look at even the quarterly performance, you'll see, remember, that Q2 
Uh, if you look at Q2 performance, which is the, the brown one, the brown line, you can see USD gold, Bitcoin and Ethereum were all down, but they're all up this month. Bitcoin up 7.12% uh, quarter to date. So since the end of June up to now, this is where we're seeing Bitcoin performing. Now, in terms of our four horsemen, this is one of our biggest and most important components uh, of how the global markets are starting to do. We did see a lot of mixed data coming in from the different parts of the market. Uh, we did see that uh, inflation came in from Germany lower. That's also showing some headwinds, some tailwinds in inflation. Crude oil um, weekly stocks also came in up. So that also now pushes uh, or expectations of oil prices down. And also uh, Chinese inflation uh, is in disinflation for the first time since 2021. That's actually a big piece of news. That's actually driving the copper price. And also PPIs have continued to get deeper in inflation. They're going to 4.41% year on year producer price indices in China. We're seeing interest rates coming down except for mortgage rates in the UK. Mortgage rates in the UK up from 7.54% to 7.68%. But in terms of German bonds, they're, they're trading lower. UK 52-week bonds are trading lower. And also UK three-year notes are trading lower. Uh, so there is a little bit of downward pressure on interest rates, on the expectation that inflation has started to slow down. Now, U.S. small business optimism has also jumped up as well from 91 to 91.9. With it, with uh, with with um, U.S. the red book retail sales also up 0.3 percent from where it was year on year. Wholesale trade trade in America is where we're seeing weakness, but Korean unemployment uh, is also still at uh, below three percent, but did jump a little bit. So we are seeing in general that our main indicators are showing us that we are getting softer than expected growth and industries, but inflation is softening up while interest rates are also starting to come down a little bit. And that is our main read from our data sources and our points. Now, let's get into our main stories for the day. Yesterday's big news came out. Zambia National Building Society paid a 30 million quarter dividend to the Ministry of Finance, citing strong performance. At the AGM uh, in 2023 in June, it was reported that there was a 60% increase in profit after tax of 185 million quarter for Zambia National Building Society for the year ending March 2023. Minister of Finance did actually call this call call out most state-owned enterprises to bring in dividends instead of needing bailouts. So he did say, look, we want to see them actually performing better. Um, well, I'm paraphrasing there, but he's trying to say we'd like to see an emulation of this kind of performance from the other uh, state-owned enterprises because the government would like to receive money from their companies, not constantly keep putting money into their companies. And there are a lot of state-owned enterprises, I'm sure, that got that message yesterday. Other news that we did get from our Money FM team is that we saw Zambia Tourism Agency reports continuing strong recovery in Victoria Falls visits. Quarter two reports show that Victoria Falls visits were up 64% year on year versus 48% uh, in quarter one, Stephanie, have you recently gone to the uh, gone to Livingstone, the Victoria Falls? When's the last time you went, or first time? Um, well, I was quite young. You see, the, these are the ones we need to market to. We need these social influencers to market to, and uh, Stephanie. And uh, anyway, I also haven't been. I've, I think I last went there. I think a few years back. So I, I, I get it. I get it. But yeah, they actually are seeing that year end. Um, the expectation was that we're going to have 1.5 million visitors at Victoria Falls by the end of the year on the expectation that we have about 750,000. And also it's expected that in the second half of the year, we see more visits to the Victoria Falls. It has been driven by both domestic and international visitors in what we call post-pandemic revenge trap. Are you planning that, by the way? You know, everyone is saying, we were locked up for so long. Now we want to travel. We want to see the world. There's a lot of people who just come out and saying they're taking revenge on the pandemic and traveling. What do you think about that, Stephanie? Um, uh, I didn't get that. I'm saying the, the what we call the revenge travel. It's a trend that's happening around the world where everybody was cooped up for so long, working from home, not allowed to travel. Now everyone has decided that they're going to like make up for the three years that we, that we that they didn't have or the two years that they didn't have locked up in their homes. What do you think about that? I think it's a good idea, especially if you had saved for it. Brings more of um, foreign exchange in different countries. 
looking at the fact that um, I think uh, visitations at Victoria Falls are actually doing good at the moment. They're hoping for more. So I think that's actually a plus for the country. It is, it is. Now I'm just thinking everybody, but you know what you always say? Uh, remember, I always give you five investment goals, five saving and investment goals you should have out there. Harvest, which is your final retirement. Health, which is making sure that you have covered health care through insurance or assets by the time you are in your retirement years. Higher education, which is getting your children towards the best tertiary institution that you can afford and you can manage. Afford is an important question, people. It's an important statement. Home ownership, making sure that you're saving and investing towards being able to finance your home ownership aspirations because you don't want to retire without a home. And finally, huge purchases. And one of the huge purchases, Stephanie, is saving for a vacation. So if you're ahead on some of these goals, it's a good idea to always plan out a big vacation, maybe every two to five years, and say, hey, I'm due a vacation. And that's actually a good thing. Go and see a place you haven't seen before. Go and see another thing. I, I'm planning on heading west, uh, Stephanie. I've, I've always said uh, I've got an idea. I have to see 10 beaches in Africa. I have to see the top 10 beaches mm. in Africa. Uh, and uh, one of them I'm planning, my, my, my angles is to aim to Namibia. Uh, that's one. There's a place called Skeleton Beach. So there's an actual, I, I was thinking because Zambia's just announced that we might start flights that side. So we're planning on starting flights that side. While on the other side, there's a bus that goes all the way through and I get to see all of Western province. So I'm really like kind of fiddling around with the idea. How do I get there? Uh, do I go there by bus and have an adventure? Do I fly there? I'm figuring it out. Um, but it is one of the places I, I have also told myself that I want to see more of this continent as well. There's some beautiful things as well, as well as seeing more of this country. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do see that travel is something that's that I think when people have brushes with life, they realize how much they haven't lived. I think this is also what's mm -hmm. happened. There, there was an existential crisis that hit a lot of people after the pandemic. When you start seeing people passing away, things shutting down, when you see a whole world become almost get this close to becoming dystopian, you start to say, you know, maybe let me try and live a little bit more uh, instead of just kind of caging myself in. Now, that doesn't mean going to debt so that you can go and see the world. That is foolishness, people. It's absolute foolishness. OK, uh, save up for your vacations, take the vacations that you can afford uh, and do it simple. OK, there's no need. I know that Instagram has pushed people to try and compete as to who can have the best vacations. The same way Instagram and Facebook has pushed people to compete with wedding photos. Just do what you can afford. OK, save up for it and do what you can afford. Trust me, it is still as therapeutic. Your Instagram pictures are only as fancy as how much someone presses a like. And the value of people liking your photos are only so much anyway. Afterwards, we will forget and we'll see someone else's photos. But go and see some of these places, people. It's good for you. It's good for your health. It's, it's part of the things you know that you want, you would enjoy at the end of your life. It's part of your, your, the things that will make you say life was well lived. Right, Stephanie, let's get back to some of the other news that we have picked up uh, on the markets. The White House actually has detailed plans to limit sensitive investments in China. They're saying that they want to limit the transfer of technology and expertise that could have a potentially potential military applications with China. So what they're trying to avoid is because uh, they've said a lot of their chips that are even sitting in the electrical system have been made by China. So if China has bugged those chips or if they've, if they've put anything in there, they can basically switch off the U.S. grid if they wanted to. So these are, these are the things they're trying to be very careful about now. That And also part of what they've said is the use of artificial intelligence with military applications is something that they'd like to slow down in terms of activity with China. Um, and they, they did say it's going to be narrowly targeted, but it does show that competition between America and China <clears throat> is still up and running. Uh, oil and copper were down yesterday as China reported deflation and weak export data. China fell into deflation for the first time. Its it, inflation rates fell negative for the first time since February 2021, meaning weak consumer demand in China. And also exports declined by 14.5%, the lowest since the, the, since the pandemic started in February 2020. Oil production is also expected to rise in America to a record 12.76 million barrels, with inventories up 4.1 million barrels. And copper imports from chi to China from Africa have actually slowed down due to logistical reasons. 
Uh, so we're seeing that copper is having a little bit of a demand problem with China, while also oil is. So it's a mixed situation for Zambia. So uh, now, Stephanie, today's big question, as we get into the topic of discussion, what drives, what do you base your investment decisions on? The future or the present? Okay. And I'm going to throw that question at you, Stephanie. What drives your investment decision? How decision? How things are going now or where things are heading? What drives that? Both. Hmm? Elaborate, Stephanie. Elaborate. Okay, so um, how things are going now, simply because uh, my decisions, uh, the decisions I make are actually based on the cost of uh, the cost of goods, the cost of living today, and of course where things are going in terms of uh, how my business survive in the future. Let's see the um, for instance, we we have commodity prices that are rising today. And uh, probably the, the cost of fuel is also rising, then that's going to have an impact on me now. But also that could have a terrible impact on how my future will be in terms of business. So that's why I'd rather pick on both. <clears throat> so let me give it to you this way. If somebody says today's situation is tough, but the outlook is looking better, which of those, if, if, if a company, whether it's the country, a company, or anything, if it says, Right now, things are bad, but the outlook is looking strong. What's going to drive? Are you going to invest according to the bad times right now? Or are you going to invest according to the, 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 the bright future? What is going to drive you to make an investment decision out of those two, if they're opposing? Bright future, maybe. Because okay. there's some hope of a bright future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is the question we want to pose out to our listeners today, whether you're listening on radio and you want to call in, Stephanie will be able to give you the number. What drives your investment decisions more, the future or the present? If you're with us on social media, please uh, comment below. What drives your investment decisions more, the future or the present? We'd love to share your... Uh, your Just to get to, yeah. Just to get to yeah, call yeah. us, the number is uh, 077. You might want to put it up just in case someone might want to call on the socials. 077-161-290. That is the number that you're calling us on. 077-161-290. And of course, we'll get talking. Okay. And that is, yeah, so I'll just put that up for everyone to see what drives your investment decisions the most. Is it the future or the present? We're getting a few comments here, but call in on 077-1616-290. That is the Money FM line, 077-1616-290. Uh, if you're going to join us today on that call. Uh, we got a comment here from um, Sanjay uh, Bukoa who said, I picked the future because investments are meant to pay in the long term. Yes. So that is a, a question. That is a very important insight. So I'm going to share with us today three insights from an interview on Bloomberg Wealth with Citadel Investments billionaire owner Ken Griffith, who gave three pieces of investment advice. OK, he gave three pieces of investment advice that every investor should follow. And the first one he talks about is the forward nature of financial markets. And here you go. Do not appreciate how forward looking financial markets are. So people often do not appreciate how forward looking financial markets are. When a company announces a great quarter and you see the stock price fall, people go, well, I mean, how did that happen? It's because investors had anticipated an even better quarter. Markets are forward looking by nature. Okay, so that's so he, he and remember that Citadel Investments, one of the biggest investment management firms. And what he's trying to tell people is that when you are looking at how the price of an asset is going to perform, you look at the forward guidance. So whenever you're looking at uh, a stock, so let's say a company reports its financials, you don't look at where it's uh, at the past only. You look at the past to confirm the future, okay? 
So if the if the data leading up to the forward guidance lines up with the future that is being predicted or projected by the company's management, then that is a good report. Then you're using the future. But the real important meat of making an investment is to make a return in the future for the long term. If you are trying to make a return right now on your investments, you are most likely gambling or saving. Okay, those are the only two yeah. things you're doing. You are saving or you are gambling. Okay, if you're trying to grow your money instantly, you are gambling. If you're trying to store your money now, you are saving. And that's not a problem, by the way. You can find some stocks which you want to generate cash flow off of and save. If you're in your retirement, you don't want to be growing money for the future. You want things you can put your money in now that can generate cash flow to take care of your daily needs and your life. So that's part of what you're looking for. But if you're looking for investments, forward guidance is, is a very important thing to look at. But remember, you need to back the forward guidance with the current situation. You don't dismiss the present, okay? You take into consideration that, okay, if, if I'm seeing a trend of growing profits in the company and we've reported another quarter of growing profits or semi or six years, six months of growing profits, then when the company's managers say, we're projecting an even stronger month of, uh, a stronger quarter of growing profits coming ahead, you feel comfortable with that projection. But Stephanie, if people say, we've been losing money, losing money, but we're going to make a profit next quarter. You're going to say, but from where? From where now? Because the situation yeah. right now is showing that we're on that trajectory. It's terrible. Yeah. Exactly. So what the present does is it helps paint the picture of the future. So remember, people, the present is still important because it reinforces the, the feasibility and the confidence you can have in the direction we are going. So if, when, if, you are, if you're not seeing, you know, there's an old saying, Stephanie, that uh, mm -hmm. dating advice where they say, you know, if, if you really want, if you, Miles Monroe used to say, uh, if a man asks you to, to, uh, to go out with him or to marry him, you don't ask him how much he earns or stuff. You ask him, where are you going? Which direction is this life of yours going? Because evidently you're asking me to join you in a journey. Where, where's your journey heading? And he says, you, you use the things you can see in his life right now that should also mark this direction. Because he can say, oh, I'm planning this, 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 but nothing in his current life says he's going to do any of those things. Or he has any intentions of doing those things. Okay? So the present reinforces the higher probability of the future. Okay, so take that as dating advice, take it as investment advice. That's all I'm trying to tell you. That the current is mm -hmm. important. And you also use the past because you want to build a trend. You want to build a trajectory. And then you, it also adds context to the strategy that's being painted. So it's very important. I'll give you an example. Right now, Zambia's investment climate looks almost poor. It's bad. We've got slow growth. We've got elevated inflation. We've got volatile currency. But there's a, the, the underlying facts are starting to show that somewhere around 2025, we should see the currency stave off inflation back into the 6 to 8% range and growth back above the 4% number, okay? Because we're going to drop to about 2.8% this year. But right now, a lot of investors are still, even under my own advice, are packing their money into safe assets, which is the two to the two to five year government bonds, the one to the one year treasury bill and the two to five year government bonds. Why? Because the present still requires it, but it's part of a long term strategy. So the reason, the way you will use the future is if you have a long term strategy, you become more future oriented. So I'm going to tell you one thing, Stephanie, your investment time, your investment um, triggers, whether it's the future or the present, are mainly driven by your by, by the, the time horizon of your investment strategy. So if you're trying to get rich today, you are going to only invest on the indicators of today. If you're trying to get wealthy in the future and you're smart about it, if you're not smart about it, you will only invest on future information. But if you're smart about it, you invest in both future and present information. You use present to reinforce or to paint a strategic picture of how the future is going. I'll give you, a simple, I'll give you another example. When I'm sitting down with clients, Stephanie, I go through three, three steps. Okay? And I take them through something I call, and yes, people, it's going to start with the same letter. That's how I operate. Get used to it. 
situation, system, and uh, uh, sorry, situation, uh, situation, strategy, system. Those are the three steps I take a person to. So I first ask you, what do you have now? Where are you financially now? Mm -hmm. Then I ask, where do you want to get to? So strategy, what age do you want to retire? How much do you want to retire with? Those are the questions we start to build onto. And then we bridge the gap with systems that we can build in there. What are the things we're going to do with your cash, with your assets, with your liabilities, with your risk, with your tax, uh, with your estate? What are the systems we have to build in the bridge there so that you can go, you, you can, you can go from where you are right now? Because where you are is important to where you want to get to. Where you are now is an important part because it will determine. So, Stephanie, let's say if I tell you, Stephanie, you have to get from here to the other side of Lusaka in 10 minutes. Are you going to walk or take a car? I'll take a car. You have to. Okay. You have to because if you have to get there in 10 minutes, it requires you to take a vehicle. So the vehicle changes according to the time constraints between you and the future or you and the destination. So you see the differences there. So here's some other answers that we've seen today. Wale Mkangu has said, we don't fully know the future. Decisions are made today, uh, are made today affect the future. Therefore, I look at today and project the future to inform my decisions. So you can see where he's coming from. He's saying it's a combination of the past and exactly. the future. But it is, it is, but he is saying it is forward guided. That's one of the things he's pointing at. It is forward guided. Um, Nkoma David also now says here, speaking of investing, should I move uh, my NAPSA benefits uh, if, if small to bonds? Secondly, if I choose to reinvest my coupons, how does that work? Uh, and uh, are the yields falling, especially on 10-year bonds? That is a, a consultation, my brother. You're gonna need to, we're going to need to go deeper into that one. But firstly, I would say that that is up to your situation again. I'd have to look at your situation. I'd have to look at your strategy. Then we can look at that decision as a system because that is a different answer for different people. Okay, telling you where to put your naps of money, I cannot give you a generic answer. That is a different answer for each individual mm -hmm. based on the situation. And the situation just make as where I ask questions about your budget. I ask questions about your balance sheet. I ask questions about your bio data. Those are important things that I have to look at in order before I make such a before I help before I give you such an advisory note. So that depends uh, strongly. Other piece of other piece of advice that uh, Ken Griffith did give just to add to some of this here is what he says is the the best investment advice he could give a person is uh, surrounding yourself mm -hmm. with good people. The Bible says the the that in the multitude of advisors is success. Okay, it's 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 he who surrounds himself with wise bears fruit in all seasons. Actually, um, there was a study done by Fidelity that also found that people who had strong relationships with their advisors actually weathered bad financial seasons too and were able to come up with better investment outcomes and were more confident of their future. So surround yourself with good people. Find a community of investors. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I've told people to do. It helps them become an identity and be guided by who is your investing sage. So here's what he says too as well in terms of diversifying who you're around as well. Probably the best investment advice that I never received but that I've lived my whole life around is surround yourself <coughs> with really good people. I thought about it just today, like I do many times, you know, what makes a great investor? A great investment firm is comprised of people who are optimists and pessimists and realists because in the intersection of the debates that go across that wide range of personalities, is where you find truth. It's part of the reason I'm so focused on freedom of expression. I see it in my own four walls, the, the robust and fulsome debates around how we commit our capital, what defines a good idea, what businesses to build or pursue. That's what drives the success at Citadel. Probably so I think one of the things he's trying to also state is diversity. Um, and and what he, and and the most important thing I think he said there was truth. You must not look for what makes you feel good. You must pursue what is true. 
This is the problem I've had with a lot of people who get ripped off and scammed. You try to show them the truth. They are more concerned with what makes them feel good. Okay. No, I'm going to make money on this. I'm going to. And you keep saying, you've got to be careful, people. Just take a look at data on farms. You can't go farming online and think you're going to become a mega billionaire. It's not going to work. And you keep having these conversations, but they're resistant to it because people want things. They want to hear stuff that makes them feel good instead of hearing the truth. The most important thing you must find is the truth. This is why I look at numbers a lot. Numbers are very, the, the, my numbers tell you what they are, okay? And you, you get to read and see the story in numbers themselves. Yes, some mm. people can lie with numbers. That's because people don't like to read numbers themselves, okay? But mm. if you read numbers yourself, you have a tendency to be able to see the truth for what it is. So find, find look for the truth. Okay, that is the most important, not your truth, not their truth, not this. Look for the truth. And it's often found mm. somewhere in the middle of all the arguments. Okay, it's often somewhere in the middle because nobody who's going to tell you the truth is going to tell you automatically that everything that everything they're saying is an absolute. There's always a possibility that something could be correct, could not be. No one knows everything for certain. This is why we even talk about hedging strategies, everything, diversification even of assets. It is all about finding the truth. And the final piece of investment advice that Ken Griffith goes on to give is about, know, about staying in your lane, finding an area of expertise. Listen to what he says here. ...make when they are doing things like investing. They invest in areas outside of their expertise. They assume that because they can do something well, they can do something else really well. And it's just not that simple. You know, it's like sort of saying like, a, Michael Jordan could have been a great football player. It's, you're, he's not going to be to football what he was to basketball. And a lot of people that get in trouble in their careers investing extrapolate from their success in one area to another. You know, you and I are both in the world of finance. But Carlisle's success story was written around private equity. It's a very different investment strategy than being in public markets. The skills are not readily transferable. You and I have both seen um, firms that look like ours wander into different investment strategies and different asset classes and, and often have a very difficult time because it's not the same skills. The nuances matter. So I'm going to uh, finish this off, Stephanie, by also talking about one of the worst things that happens in, in the world is one of the most targeted groups for investment scams is often doctors, um, uh, simply because those are highly intelligent people. Um, unfortunately, and my apologies to all of you who doctors, I have doctors who are clients, there's a terminology called the dumb doctor deal, which means that a lot of investors act investments which are paper dust investments are sold to doctors a lot because unfortunately a lot, what you find in the medical industry is they earn a very good amount of money, but they risk a lot of it on the assumption that their high levels of intelligence in the world of medicine are equal yeah. to their high levels of intelligence in investing. And that's not the case. They're not well studied often. They're easily bamboozled. Um, they, they, there's a lot of ego that trips them up. The good thing is I'm seeing a new crop of doctors, the younger ones who have become, who I think I've seen the older generations mess up a lot with money mm -hmm. and they're trying to make different decisions now. But where the dangers come is the, I, they, there's a lot of I know it all because doctors are very respected that when they speak on medical mm -hmm. matters, you can't even say a word that they take that into investing. And as a result, what happens is a lot of people play on their ego and a lot of doctors have a tendency of losing a lot of their high income in very, very, very bad investments, very bad investments, which ends up taking them from the lifestyle of the doctor while they were earning to dust by the time they're retiring. So it's very important um, to know that however intelligent you are in your field, you cannot automatically think that's transferable into assets, into assets and investing. The group of people who I've seen do very well when it comes to investing are actually engineers. Engineers mm -hmm. have a 
tendency to follow instructions and follow plans. They seek plans. Okay, they're very strong with this. I'll tell you that's because some of my leading, even my client base, there are a lot of engineers in there. And it's simply because when you give them a plan, they follow it rigorously. And they're so intent on receiving a plan. Okay, so they take their ego out of it. They assume they don't know. And they learn very quickly that they need to absorb a plan. Now, I'm not saying all doctors or engineers. I'm just telling you, this is a situation you need to be careful of. Do not think mm. that high level of intelligence in your field makes it transferable to money that's a totally different skill set that's a totally different mm -hmm. base of character so you have to be very very careful um this is why at the beginning you need to surround yourself with good people get guidance get educated get guidance then get started simple and work your way it requires humility because you will go out for those extravagant exotic assets and you will burn your fingers horribly and lose a lot of your wealth because you decided that you were too smart to start where everyone else starts. I'm sorry to say this, mm -hmm. but when it comes to money, everyone starts in grade one. Everyone. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how wealthy you are. I don't care how big your business is. When it comes to money and investments, everyone starts in grade one. And I'm going to leave it there today, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Of course, uh, to those that have sent text messages, as well as to those that try to call, just make sure you make it a call as we do it again. We do have Venon, obviously, saying good morning to everyone in a series titled Billions. The lead character once said, the great always secure their future while handling the immediate. Investing is not a one-time activity, but rather a continued exercise in view of securing the future. And which I do agree. On that note, Munyumba, till tomorrow again, it's bye.